Chapter Four of the Seven Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seven Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter Four. Interesting news. The midwinter blizzard continued, and so intense was the cold, and so unceasing the cutting, icy blast, that Mr. Morrist, at the request of several parents, sent forth a messenger to inform the day pupils that classes would not be resumed till the storm had subsided. But wind, ice, and snow had no terrors for the members of the SSC, and since important matters were afoot in the reorganization of their club, it was decided, by whose phones had not been put out of use by the tempest, to beg or borrow a sleigh and hold the meeting at the home of Bertha Angel on Monday instead of the following Saturday. Mr. Angel, being a grocer, possessed several delivery sleighs, and since Bertha could drive as well as her brother Bob, Mary, whose phone was out of order, was amazed to see such an equipage draw up in front of her door at about two on that blizzardy afternoon. Her first thought was that Bob was delivering groceries, but why at the front of the house, since he always went in at the side drive? Then, as the snow curtain lifted a little, she discerned the forms of several persons warmly wrapped and actually huddled on the straw-covered box part of the delivery sleigh. The driver was tooting on a horn and looking hopefully towards the house. Then it dawned on Mary that it was Bertha who was driving, and not Bob, as she had supposed. In a twinkling she leaped at the door of the storm vestibule and called that she would be right with them. And she was, clad in her warmest, an Esquimau girl could not have been more hidden in fur. How her brown eyes sparkled as she climbed up on the front seat by the driver, which place had been reserved for her since she was president. Of all the grand and glorious surprises, she exclaimed, glancing back at the laughing huddle as Bertha drove out of the gate, why i declare to it you've even got our rosebud how did you manage that i didn't think her mother would let her out of the house again until next summer it took lots of love and suasion i can assure you rose replied and i don't even know if that would have worked had it not been that an old friend whom mother hadn't seen in years arrived in a station sleigh to spend the afternoon and in order to be freed from my teasing the lovely lady said wrap up well and take a foot warmer three cheers for the friend mary said then added drawing her fur coat closer my how dense the snow is give me that horn bursey i'll toot it so other vehicles will know that we are coming the comfortable old white house set among tall evergreen trees that was the angel's home was in the centre of the town on the long main street and not far from the angel's grocery the best of its kind in the village Bertha drove close to the front steps, bade the girls go right in and wait for her in the sitting-room while she took the delivery sleigh back to the store. But hardly had they swarmed out when a merry whistle was heard through the curtain of snow, and the form of a heavy-set boy appeared. "'Oh, good, here comes Bob,' his sister called. "'I'd know that whistle in darkest Africa. It out-robins a robin for cheeriness.' "'Hello, SSCs,' a jolly voice called, and then a walking snowman stopped at the foot of the steps and waved a white arm to the girls who were standing under the shelter of the porch roof. "'Going to spread more sunshine today? Well, it sure is needed.' Bertha, having climbed down, Bob leaped up on the high seat and took the reins. Then, with a good-natured grin on his ruddy, freckled face, the boy called, "'It was shabby of us to guess what your SSC meant, wasn't it? "'Boys are clever in that way, but girls aren't supposed to be very clever, you know. "'If they're good-looking and good cooks, that's all we of the superior sex expect of them.' "'Indeed, is that so, Mr. Bob? "'Peggy just could not keep quiet. "'I suppose you think we never could guess the meaning of your CDC?' "'I know you couldn't,' Bob replied with such conviction that Mary, "'fearing that it would tantalise Peg into betraying their knowledge, "'changed the subject with—' "'Suppose you'll take us all home, Bob, before dark sets in?' right oh, was the cheery response as the boy started the big dapple horse roadward. Fifteen minutes later the girls were seated about the wide fireplace in the large, comfortably furnished living room. This home lacked the elegance that was to be found in the palatial residence of Rose, nor did it have the many signs of culture that Mary's father and mother had collected in their travels, but there was a homely atmosphere about it that was very pleasant.' Mrs. Angel, short, plump, cheerful, whom Bob closely resembled, appeared for a moment to greet the girls and then returned to a, a task in another part of the house. Bertha, who had disappeared, soon returned with a huge wicker basket. I thought we might just as well keep on with our spread sunshine activities, she explained, even though we have added a new meaning to our SSC. 
She was taking out small, all-over aprons of blue gingham, as she spoke. The name of a girl was pinned to each one. "'Sure thing!' Mary reached for her garment. "'Our fingers can sew for the orphans while our tongues can unravel mysteries, if—' Her eyes were twinkling as they turned inquiringly toward Peggy Pierce. "'Our committee of two has unearthed one yet.' "'Of course we haven't,' was the maiden's indignant response. "'How could we find a mystery in a snowstorm like this?' "'True enough,' Mary said in a more consolatory tone. "'I really had not expected you to.' In truth, Rose curled in the big easy chair near the fire, putting teasingly, For that matter, we don't expect a real mystery to be unearthed in this little sound-asleep town of Sunnyside. Goodness, don't we know everybody in it, and don't our parents know their parents, and their grandparents, and— Well, somebody new might come to town, Doris, the second member of the sleuth committee, remarked hopefully. Sure thing, someone might, Mary said, with such an emphasis on the last word that Bertha dropped her work in her lap to comment. "'You speak as though you knew that someone new is coming.' "'I do,' Mary replied calmly, bending over her sewing, that the girls might not see how eager she was to tell them her news. "'Stop being so tantalising, Mary. What in the world do you know today that you didn't know Saturday?' Peg inquired. "'Oh, I know, I know,' Rose sang out. "'It's something that handsome boy Alfred Morrison told you when he went to call on Jack. Out with it, Mary. Don't keep us in suspense.' "'Of course! How stupid we didn't think to ask what happened after you and Alfred Morrison had left us at our homes,' Doris put in. "'We knew he was going with you to call on Jack. Is he coming to live in Sunnyside? Say, wouldn't it be keen if he did?' "'Well, you are all warm, anyway,' Mary conceded. "'The someone who is coming to live in Sunnyside, I mean the someone to whom I am referring, is a girl. But I guess we won't want to cultivate her acquaintance at all, at all.' "'Mary Lee, if you don't tell us, I shall come over there and shake you until you do.' Betty Bird was so tiny that this threat made the girls all laugh gaily. But it had the desired effect, for their president ceased teasing and told them a story which interested them greatly. End of chapter 4